When we settle down with the breath, we're trying to bring three things together. Your sense of the body, a feeling of pleasure, and your awareness. Those are the first three frames of reference that the Buddha talks about in establishing mindfulness. The fourth frame of reference, dhammas, is basically lists of qualities and other things to look out for to help bring those other three things together. In other words, there's a list of hindrances. Those are things you want to abandon. The factors for awakening, those are things you want to develop. The fetters with regard to the six senses, those are to be abandoned as well. There are the five aggregates, which are things to be comprehended, five clinging aggregates. And then the Four Noble Truths, which apply their duties to what you're doing right now, i.e., your main duty right now is to develop concentration, because that's part of the path. So in the beginning, we take these three things, we try to bring them together, and they don't fit quite together, which is why we have to do a lot of direct thought and evaluation, figuring out what's wrong. What's wrong with the breath? What's wrong with the mind? I mean, the breath does get comfortable. What can you do to take that sense of ease and make it go through the body? Because what we want to end up with is a sense of the sense of pleasure suffusing the body, and your awareness suffusing the body. So they all become one, and you can really settle in. But you've got to maintain that sense of awareness and breath and pleasure until the pleasure starts feeling gross. Not gross in the sense of being disgusting, but just not subtle enough. You want something more subtle. Before the pleasure feels gross, you've got the rapture that starts feeling a little bit too much. You let that die away. Then the pleasure dies away. So you've just got breath and awareness. And then the breath will stop. There'll still be breath energy in the body. In fact, it's the connectedness of the breath energy in the body that allows your in and out breathing to stop. You don't force it to stop. It's just that when everything is so well connected in the body, there's no felt need to breathe. Sometimes this will be startling when you suddenly realize you haven't been breathing for a while. But as you get more and more used to it, you realize that you don't need to. When the body needs to breathe, it will breathe. You're not suppressing anything. You're just being very still, very balanced. It's at that point where your sense of the knower comes to the fore. Because as the breath stops, the movement of the inner breathing which is something that defines your sense of the body, it gets less and less and less, and so you're just left with a cloud of little sensation droplets. And there's a vague sense of that it has a kind of body shape, but it's not very well defined. And as a John Fuang would teach, you have to wait to that point because before you really start getting into is being with the sense of knowing on its own. Prior to that point, you can have a sense of the knower, of what's aware of things, but it's not going to be stable. Because what you need as you go through the concentration is you're trying to get a perception that you can hold on to. And there will be gaps in the perception, but as long as there's something obvious that you can focus on to sustain the perception. For example, like the breath. You've got the breath as your main object, so you're thinking about the breath. And if the perception happens to lapse for a bit, the breath is still there, coming in, going out, and so you apply the perception again. And that's what keeps you there. The two help each other along. But if you're going to focus on the knower at that point, you don't know exactly where you're going to focus. And when there's a gap in this perception, it's gone. So you need help in learning how to make your perceptions more and more continuous. And this is what mindfulness is for. It stitches these perceptions together. So you get to the point where the perceptions are constant, regardless of whether the breath is going to be there or not. And that's when you can let the breath go. 
And it's not the case that you don't try to develop a sense of the observer as something separate from early on, but it's just simply that it's not going to be as prominent, it's not going to be as obvious, and it's not going to hit home in the same way as when the mind has settled down to the point where the breath has stopped and your sense of the body is beginning to dissolve and you've just got the awareness left. When that happens, there will come a point in my this, this is my awareness. I'm not talking about something far away that's in a Dharma book someplace. It's right here. And it's very clear and very obvious. It's like tuning into a radio station. At first there may be some static because you haven't tuned quite precisely, but then when you're well tuned and the radio is locked into the signal, then there's no more static. But you don't have to wait until that point to have at least some use out of this idea of the knower. I mean, it starts very early on when the Buddha talks about dealing with unpleasant words from other people. If someone says something nasty, you just remind yourself an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. And see if you can leave it at that. And not stitch it into stories about who the person is, or how bad their intentions are, or how much you feel hurt by it, or whatever. It's just the contact at the ear. And then drop it. You're observing what's there, but you're trying not to add anything more to what's there. That's the role of this observer. And you try to learn to do that with painful feelings as well. The feeling is there, but you can, can you allow it to be there without a lot of commentary, a lot of complaints? Can there be just the sensation? Without any thought about how long the sensation is there, or how much longer it's going to be here, you're not dragging yourself down. So just, no, there it is. Now, th this sense of the knower will waver because it doesn't yet have the same solidity as it would if it, you're coming out of strong states of concentration. But it's helpful to keep in mind that this is something to aspire to. It's like having a good poker face. Whatever comes up, you're not faced, and you don't show any signs of being faced. Well, you want to have that to be kind of like a poker mind. Whatever comes up, you figure it's all equal. The part of your mind will say, no, it's not equal at all, but you can tell yourself. You can, For the time being, you can borrow some of the Buddha's discernment. This is what the strength of or the treasure of learning is. We're borrowing the Buddha's discernment to help us when we can't create discernment of our own. And part of it is learning how to see pleasure and pain, or feelings of pleasure and pain as they come in as equal, having equal value. So the mind doesn't get turned by these things. Because what you're doing is developing patience, endurance, together with equanimity and learning how to apply them in areas where you hadn't applied them before. And learning how to talk yourself into seeing these things as good things to have. Part of the mind says you're being impassive. Part of the mind says you're being dull, not standing up for your rights, not defending yourself, whatever. And you have to learn how to say no to those voices. Say, learning how to be just with what's there, and then let it go as it passes away. It's a skill you're going to need how to develop. So you work at it outside of the meditation, too. When I was staying with the John Fung, he would test me. As my concentration was getting better, he would say things that he knew would usually get me upset. In the beginning, I didn't realize what was happening, and I'd get upset. But then I realized, oh, he's testing me. See how well I can take this sense of being impassive and solid in the face of whatever. Then the advantage of that is you learn how to, to not get phased by criticism from you know, people you respect. 
This doesn't mean that you brush it off, but simply you don't react emotionally. And that allows you to look at it and see exactly where is this person right? What can I benefit? How can I benefit from the criticism? And then you can develop that attitude that John Lee talks about, how you can take anything that the world throws at you and see that it's got its good side as well as its bad side. No matter how good it may seem in terms of the world, it has its bad side. Wealth, fame, praise, those things you've got to watch, watch out for. And the things that the world says is bad. These things have their good side as well. Loss, loss of status, criticism. You learn from criticism. You learn from all these things. But you learn best when you're not reacting. And you can develop this sense of just knowing that it's there and not getting carried away by all the embroidery that we tend to add to these things. And when you can bring that attitude to your meditation, it helps a lot. First, when things are not going well, you're not getting upset. You say, well, this is a job that's going to take some time. I've been following my defilements, I've been following my cravings, they've been leading me around by the nose for who knows how long. So it's going to take a while to undo those habits. And then as things start going well, to make sure you don't get excited. All too often it happens that the mind finally set, settles down, and he feels really good, and you get excited and you've lost it. Now some people would say, well, it's because I've been trying too hard or I like it too much. It's not that you like it too much, it's what you want. It's just you have to learn how to not be so reactive. And say, oh, there's that. Oh, there's that. I think what's going to happen if you get excited about a little bit of concentration. If something better than that came along, you get, you get really excited. You'd lose that too. Because one of the skills you have to develop as better and better things develop in the meditation is just say, oh, there's this. And hold the mind in check. So you can observe what happens after this. And you learn how to observe it better. This is why the Buddha told Rahula to make his mind like earth from the very beginning. Whatever gets poured on the earth, the earth doesn't react. You won't have that same quality of non-reactivity. And that's what's meant by being with the observer, being with the knower. It is a construct. You construct it out of your perceptions. But it's what you want to develop as one of the fruits of your concentration, so that whatever happens, you have this place to resort to. That then becomes a good basis for your discernment, because your discernment is going to be seeing connections between causes and effects. And sometimes you'll be seeing connections you don't like at all. In other words, you see something really stupid you're doing, and you should have known better. Now that you realize well, it's not necessary and it is stupid. And if you cannot get upset by that fact, then you can let it go. Ultimately, there is a, another kind of consciousness that, un, that lies on the other side of concentration that comes as a result of the discernment. That's something else entirely. This is a point that so often gets confused. People think you get to the sense of just the knower, or just to be the knowing, and that somehow you've reached the unconditioned. It's still very, very conditioned, because you've got a name for it, and it's, you can stay with it only as long as you stick with the name, the perception. There was a Western monk who asked a John Cha about this one time, because everybody there was assuming that the, the knower and the concentration and the awakened awareness were the same thing. So I asked a John Cha point blank, and a John Cha said, uh, no, of course it's not. They're two very different things. So it's important to keep that distinction in mind, and to develop the sense of the knower as one of your skills as a meditator, so you can be impassive and watch things clearly for what they are, and then watch cl clearly as things move from one step to the next step in the mind. 
so you don't get excited by the first step and miss all the ones that come after. So try to make this knower like earth, in the sense that it's non-reactive. To make it like air, in the sense that anything can go through. Yet at the same time that you're not dull and unperceptive, you're very perceptive, but unmoved by things. And it's only then that you can really see things for what they are. To the point where you can work your way past them. 